Before we get started, I want to let you know I have Enneagram mugs for sale. You can sip and shine and sip and grow. One side has the positive traits of the number, while the other side has a challenge for that number to help keep them balanced and not giving in to that compulsive Enneagram type that we can tend to get into sometimes. So check that out at doitforthegrampodcast.com forward slash online dash store. It'll also be in a link in the bottom of the notes, the show notes for this episode. So you can click there and get an Enneagram mug. It's perfect for gifts. It's that time of year trying to find a gift for someone, especially that person who like has everything or buys himself everything. This type of gift could be one for them. So check it out. These different mugs that we have for each Enneagram type and get you one. So welcome to Do It For The Gram and Enneagram podcast with your host, certified Enneagram coach, Milton Stewart, where we do it for the Enneagram, not Instagram. We make moves to improve ourselves and our communities. On this episode, because I know it's been a while, on this episode, I am doing Enneagram and kids. Yes, Enneagram and kids. This can be a tricky topic because there's a lot of different information going on out there. There's a lot of different opinions and views going out there about it. And I wanted to weigh in on it and just how I feel about it and how I use it with the kids that I work with. So I uh, just wanted to share that. So this episode, we're going to get rocking and rolling, going to get you into this thing. And then you can see maybe how you could possibly use the Enneagram to help out youth in your life. All right, let's go intro music. Kick it. that comes up like all the time at conferences and uh, certification programs and different groups that I work with and I'm just a part of is should I tell my kids about the Enneagram? And I am all for telling kids about the Enneagram. I am 100% for it. Obviously not to push it down their throats or shove it upon them because you do want them to be able to grow up and learn and develop and everything. But I am all for teaching them the Enneagram, even the different ways of the Enneagram. Even if you don't know necessarily their type, like understanding the pivotal elements of each of the nine types, all those things we need to know and grow in, it's just some of them we struggle with more than others and some of them we're better at than more than others. But teaching kids these things can be very beneficial to their development, health, and growth. And we're talking about the internal health too, not just the external health. When I work with a lot of the kids that I work with, the reason I feel the Enneagram is so important to use is because the kids I work with, they have a lot of trauma. They have a lot of ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. And so those things impact families and kids in such a negative way that it causes a lot of times for that personality to be even stronger than it naturally should be. And for them, sometimes it leads them to making even more poor decisions, which further hurts them, creates more adverse childhood experiences and more trauma, not only for them, but for kids and other people around them. So my thing is introducing the Enneagram is so important, understanding that there's more to us and helping them to understand there's an inner world going on. Similar to the movie Inside Out, there's an inner world of emotions and feelings and senses and everything going on that we must address if we're going to be truly healthy and productive citizens and people in general for our community and for others. So I say definitely yes. Now, depending on the kid's maturity is where you want to determine, like, how do I introduce this? And so you can introduce the Enneagram without saying this is the Enneagram. You can pay attention to patterns and you can say, hmm, how about we work on forgiveness? How about we work on empathy? I see that my child or the youth that I work with is struggling in this area. So let's find out this specific thing and start to work on it. And so when it comes to testing them, that's a whole different tricky element. And I know that gets a little a little weird because, first of all, people like to test online with online tests, which I am not a fan of, even though that's how, you know, most people like figure out, like, which number am I? 
to a certain degree because there's a lot of mistyping. And what I would hate for is for a kid to mistype and then they're going along trying to portray themselves as this per se or whatever. But nevertheless, that is also still one way. If they're like a teenager and you feel that they can, you know, take the test. If you know them enough to trust them to say, okay, let's take this test and let's see what you come out with and let's work with it, you know, but don't make sure you don't affix the number to them as if that's all that they are, because that's the one thing you don't want to do. And I think that's the fear when a lot of people are scared to teach children um, the Enneagram is because they fear that the people who know of the Enneagram are using it in a way to put people in a box and say, oh, no, that's your number. That's you. Oh, you just a five. You just an old five like that. And not allowing a child to develop in the sense of being able to make their own decisions and being able to be themselves and choose if they are a five, choosing different numbers they're going to utilize in their lives to be uh, successful and to manage life. And so that's the one thing you don't want to do is place a number on like, oh, you're just doing all those six things. And don't, don't do that. That's the one thing. And I think the fear behind people not introducing the Enneagram at an earlier age to you, I think personally is super important. But like I said, you introduce it in a way that is beneficial, that is helpful. And you may not even have to mention the word Enneagram necessarily. And so what age would I say? It depends on maturity of the kid. Some kids are so mature, you can start teaching them around six or seven and they're like listening and like, hmm, okay, all right, I'm working on this. Like for real, my godson, unbelievably intelligent. If I worked with him on this, he would understand the word Enneagram and he would understand his type if we could figure it out together. He would work on it and be totally fine with it because his maturity level is outrageous right now. It's kind of crazy. But at the same time, I'm working with, I mentor a 12 year old and right now he could care less about the Enneagram, though I pinpoint so many different things that it challenges him and works with him to help him grow. He could care less about the system of it right now at this time. So I still weave it in and out of our conversations, the way that I teach him, the way that I train him, the way I help him to understand himself and how to combat some of the things he struggles with. But it's just all in the maturity of the kid when it comes to introducing them to the system of the Enneagram. And so I usually do it based on if I can figure out their number or at least the area within their end, like the intelligence center, then I can start to work from there because I can start to see some blaring things. Do they fear a lot? Most likely they're in the thinking triad. I mean, a lot. Just fear for fear sometimes, you know, or they're denying the fear, but they definitely have it. Do they have this pent up anger? Seems to be like always kind of there. They can be in the anger triad, eights, nines, and ones. Or is shame a really huge thing to them in their image? Is that like super important to them? And they feel really bad if they feel like, They've been shamed somehow or they did something that should, they should be ashamed of. Does it weigh on them extremely heavy? They could be a two, three or four. So that's some ways you can slowly get to it. Just watching the patterns of the youth or the kid that you work with can really help. And so a part of the important part of teaching that is teaching them what inner work is in their insides. And that's teaching them how to be emotionally intelligent. It's teaching the IQ EQ and the GQ, which a good friend of mine put down. She said GQ. And I was like, GQ, that's a magazine. But she said gut intelligence. What I was like, that makes a lot of sense. Understanding the sensing part of your body and your gut and what it is trying to tell you and are you listening to it? And then also understanding the emotional intelligence side of like what is going on in my emotions and how do I regulate them and manage them towards others as well is very important. And also the thinking portion, which we know is IQ, which is the part that they teach in school more than anything, just understanding how that process works and what are my thought patterns. And when I go there, how do I retract myself from negative thought patterns to get back on a healthy streak? And how do I address when I go there and what triggers all of these emotional thinking and even gut reactions that may not be necessarily positive or I just need to address something that I'm not addressing. So how do I address those? So teaching kids that inner work of like, when you feel some kind of way, communicating it, learning how to do that, because that helps to get to the root of the issue instead of constantly going through the same issue over and over again. And then they're not able to explain what's going on. So for as adults, learning to use words such as emotions and thoughts and senses and helping kids to realize like these things are going on inside just makes you want to respond a certain way. That could be extremely beneficial for helping them grow and develop into a healthy human being. Does your workplace stink because the culture sucks? Are you tired of tolerating people and wish you could all work together cohesively? 
Does the mere idea of going into work give you anxiety? If you say yes to any one of these, you should probably quit your job. But since you're not going to quit your job, you should contact Kaizen Careers. At Kaizen Careers, we are all about improving workplace performance. We use a unique tool called the Enneagram. The Enneagram helps individuals and organizations become more self-aware. That self-awareness lends into helping organizations with communication, conflict management, and leadership development, ultimately turning self-awareness into self-mastery and creating healthy workplace cultures so you can improve your services and bottom lines. Contact Kaizen Careers at K-A-I-Z-E-N-C-A-R-E-E-R-S dot com or Milton at KaizenCareers.com or give us a call at 901-334-1644. I do even with parents. It's very interesting because I have parents who may struggle working with their kid and different things are going on and they'll say, I make sure they have food, I make sure they have a shelter, I make sure the clothes are clean, I make sure they have new clothes, I make sure they go to the doctor, I do all these things with them and show them I love them, but they don't understand and all these different things. And my response is, you're right. Sometimes kids don't understand completely what you're doing for them. At the same time, the most important things are actually the things on the inside of them, not on the outside. Like those outside things, yes, they do impact kids, especially growing up because other kids can be super cruel, especially middle schoolers at that time. There's so much development going on. So kids can be really cruel and not really think about what they're saying and the impact they have on others. And that's another reason why teaching Enneagram is important, helping them understand themselves and things that they have going on and that other people have stuff going on and they feel differently. But something that's really important is that I talk to the parents and different people that you have to dive into their inner world, too, and figure out what is going on with your emotions, your thought processes and your senses, as I mentioned earlier. And that's making you respond or react this way or just being able to communicate those things with them in a very honest fashion. Because kids, a lot of times, don't show exactly what they're thinking, feeling, even though they may be feeling it. Sometimes a lot of them aren't extremely direct unless you have a baby who's an eight or or, um, a five, you know, who's going to ask a straight question and they're going to cut through all of the gook or crap and uh, just ask you straightforward or say something. And maybe even a one, I would say two as well. But so they won't communicate some of those things. So you're going to have to ask questions to kind of get them rolling and thinking about it and to get them used to expressing themselves internally, because that's going to help develop them and help them to start the growth process of looking within to see what's going on instead of searching outside of themselves for the answers to everything or blaming everything outside of them. It's hard to look inside and figure out what in the world is going on and why am I doing, feeling and acting the way that I am. So that's going to be super important to making sure that you get into, you find a way to get in, help them get into their inner world. And what that may mean is that you delve into your inner world with them as well to help them to kind of understand and give them the language to use to describe what's going on inside, because that is teaching. That is teaching and that is helping them to slowly kind of understand what's going on. And so the inner work is super important. It is more important than the outer work, than how you look and how you dress and your hair and your outer accessories. And so helping kids understand that is monumental to building their self-esteem and building empathy for them as well. So on this part, I'm going to go ahead and um, here's some of my advice for working with the different types of kids that you encounter. And this is only broken down by one through nine, not specifically the subtypes, but I'm trying to hint it. I'm trying to hit the underlining and the, the underpinning issue of that type, especially as I've seen in kids. And so one of them is for, so let's start with the number one. I would say toning down their overt rightness and inner critic. Also addressing anger and aggression. So one of my mentees is an Enneagram one. Oh my goodness. I mean, grades are superb. His grades are absolutely amazing. He strives to do the right thing and try to be right. And the struggle right now is that he is in fifth grade. And so he's about to start like hitting puberty. And so trying to be cool is a cool thing. And so he has this challenge of trying to be cool, which means that I listen to the songs everybody else listens to and say some of the words and I do all these things. But at the same time, trying to be right and feeling kind of angry at himself about it and resentful. And so it's really interesting because we'll have these he'll he'll have like this really serious question or conversation and then I want to talk about it. So for ones, if you have a child that you're like, oh, my baby one 
or a youth you're working with that is a one that have that repressed anger thing going on, something you can work on is helping them tone down their overt rightness and inner critic, their willingness and having to be right and correct about everything, helping them to tone that down. Also addressing anger and aggression directly. A lot of times they repress anger. And so that it comes out in these random, really quick strikes of spurting out just like a random burst of anger. And then they feel really, really bad about themselves. So one thing you can do for ones is, first of all, helping them to actually address the anger that they have in their lives. Because a lot of times ones get the message that anger is bad. Anger is wrong. I shouldn't be angry. But no, it's okay to be angry. Be angry and sin not. So basically, do your best to help them understand that anger is emotion. You can use it for positive. You can use it for negative. Either one. But what you want to do is use it for positive. But also, you want to address the anger before it becomes resentment for them. Because they will store it, and then they'll be mad because something isn't fair to them. They feel like something isn't fair, and now they're angry. And so one of my mentees, he's the one. He struggles with that hardcore. And so one of the things is, he made a really bad decision because he didn't necessarily know how to communicate as a leader and part of what I have called a tech squad at the school I work at as a leader, how to communicate with the people there. And so he communicated with a little young lady who is an eight and she does not take kindly to anyone trying to direct her to do anything if she don't have the highest, most respect for you. And so she like disagreed with him and just walked on and walked out of the room and he turned around in a fit of anger and did some signals with his hands that are very inappropriate and wrong. So she left out. She immediately came and told me because she loves to do that. And when I went to address, when I went to address my mentee about this, I said, so what happened? I said, did you get in a disagreement? He was like, no, no, I didn't get in a disagreement. I was like, so you and her didn't have any like, you know, argument or say any strong words to each other. No, no, we just, you know, I, I was just telling her just to go get these certain computers. And I was like, OK, it's time for him to go. So I said, go ahead and leave. So I asked another student who was in there. And he told me exactly what the girl told me that he did. So the next morning, my mentee comes up and I look at him. I said, hmm. I said, I need you to tell me the truth, because the one thing I dislike out of anything is someone who's not trustworthy, because if I can't trust you, I don't want you around me. And so he looked at me. He was very quiet. And I said, so did you or did you not throw up some really bad hand, hand signals to her? And he just looked very stern, did not want to speak and was almost about to cry. And so I looked at him and I said, you did, didn't you? And he shook his head. Yes. And then I told him, you know, here's the consequences for that, because you lied about it. It's not the fact that you were wrong. Or you did something wrong because you're in fifth grade. I get it. You make mistakes. That's life. We all do. But it's the fact you lied to me about it, which I have the biggest issue with. We can address when you make a mistake, but when you don't admit or confess or fess up to it, it's going to be hard to address. And then it's going to make me not want you around me because then I, I can't trust you when I'm not there, which is a problem. So he had three weeks of a consequence for that. But later that day, he wanted to talk to me. He talked to his teacher and asked, could he speak with me? And he spoke with me, telling me about the situation. And he didn't want to tell me because he knew he was wrong. And for him and for ones, it is like the most painful thing for them to feel like they're bad or wrong. And so while we're having our conversation, he says, I was frustrated and my bad side came out. And so for them, understanding psychologically to stop the duality in their thinking, things are either good, bad or right or wrong. And so you're going to have to try to introduce gray to Enneagram type ones and help them understand like, hey, there's more than that. You're not it's not your bad side. You made a mistake out of anger. You were frustrated. And that's OK. We're going to work on addressing that. But you're not bad. You're not even necessarily good. You do. You make bad decisions or you make good decisions. And in the long run, those things stream together and they make up who you are. But no one's inherently just a bad person or a good person. You are a person and you make choices in life. And so helping them to understand that is very important. And so what I also use for him is I use an emotional wheel, which I'll mention later down there. And I'll attach a PDF is an emotional wheel because emotion wheel helps them to describe where in the world was going on in myself. And so when we first did it, I said, where were you? He went to anger and went all the way out to like aggression. And I said, makes sense. 
makes total sense. We're going to work on addressing that. And after we had our conversation, which I told him about unconditional love, I told him about grace, I told him about being honest. I said, how do you feel now? And he said, disgusted. And I said, with who? He said, himself. And so I took him outside and we did some breathing exercises and I helped him to become present to the moment of where we were instead of being stuck in the past of the action that he committed that he like did not like it all because it weighed on him so heavy. Ones beat themselves up so much, y'all. So for your ones who are youth and kids, you have to make sure that they understand what grace empathy and unconditional love is because if not they will struggle hardcore when things do not go right or they feel that they did something bad so helping them to understand that is going to be pivotal to their actual success and growth in life and so one of the biggest words that that i'm working on him with is empathy and not just empathy for other people per se because that comes next but empathy for himself and forgiveness for himself like i think there's a huge gap for him when it comes to especially ones when it comes to having empathy and forgiveness for themselves. They have to learn how to do that for themselves before they're actually able to do it for other people and to help that inner critic and that judgmental mind that ones typically have to calm down and to soothe and be like, okay, things are okay. Like, because life is a little messy and I will make mistakes, but I am going to be okay because I'm going to fix it and I'm going to figure out what's going on and I'm going to make a better choice going forward. I'm going to beat myself up so bad. So that is part of the one. Moving on. Twos, learning to speak directly with communication, addressing emotional manipulation and giving them space to know what they actually want. And so I also have a mentee who's a two as well. And um, it's interesting. He is so indirect with trying to get the things that he wants. And he's twos are very good at emotional manipulation making it seem like something else is someone else's fault at all the times and getting other people and adults involved in those situations to maybe handle someone or some issue they're having. So you definitely have to address that up front and help them to take responsibility for their own actions and things that's going on in their life and also help them to be direct. So my mentee is super indirect about things that he wants or things he may like or something. And so I will literally, we'll be in the car and I was like, all right, so what do you want to eat? And he'll say, uh, I don't know, I'm not sure. And I said, well, I'm not moving. I stopped the car and I said, I'm not moving till you figure out what you want and where you want it. And so this is huge for twos because twos have a natural tendency, obviously known as the helper. But one thing, they blend and try to merge and try to be what the person they're with wants them to be to a certain degree. And so that becomes very tricky because it seems like they're always like, cool, they're just, they're going with the flow, they're good with it. But they're actually harboring some things sometimes that is not healthy. And so they're trying to be quote unquote nice, but the problem is they're not being authentic and true to themselves. And a lot of times they can be pent up anger and they end up resenting a lot of things going on similar to the one in some ways. For twos, helping them to figure out what self-awareness is within them, helping them figure out what is going on, what do I want, who am I, giving them time to figure those things out, and also time for them to be alone. Twos love to be a lot of times with someone else. They love to be around someone or just be in a room with someone or be connected on the phone with someone, especially you. So one thing that I would definitely encourage if you are working with a two or have a two, make sure you give them time to be alone without the phone and to figure out what they want and give them the avenue and the space to communicate directly. Because a lot of times they do not communicate directly. They indirectly communicate so they can get what they want without saying exactly what they want. Or sometimes they really don't know what they want because they've basically been going along with other people idea. And then also the other thing too is teaching them boundaries, teaching them how to create boundaries for themselves so that they are respected for who they are and respected in teach people how to treat them. A lot of times, twos sometimes will allow people to treat them any kind of way and then be frustrated or mad about it. Teach your twos how to have boundaries and how to set those, how to tell people what their boundaries are so that they are respected and they can stay in a healthy space and care for themselves as well. Hopefully you have found some value in this podcast episode. You can help to keep this podcast going by supporting us on patreon.com. Patreon.com is a site where you can support content providers. Podcasts are free to listeners, but not free for creators. It actually costs money and definitely time to produce consistent and weekly podcasts. I podcast because I want to reach people and change our community through the Enneagram. If you want to help in that by supporting me, you can go to patreon.com forward slash do it for the gram. That is P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com 
forward slash do it for the gram. Threes. Threes, I would say teaching unconditional love, healthy competition, and helping them find their feelings and self. This is really, really important for threes because threes, I mean, they want to shine. They want to be in the light. They want to accomplish. They want to achieve. Whatever the the societal goal is to be successful, that's what they're trying to do. And so helping them to back back from that and realize and give them time and space as well to say, okay, what do you want to do really deep down? Not what everyone else wants you to do, but what do you want? And making sure that they know that you love them regardless of what happens is so important. So when I said teaching unconditional love with the three, it can be very difficult because they're trying to do something impressive before you have a chance to show them unconditional love. Because it's like, if I do this, then you like me, then you love me, then I shine. But what they have to understand is that I don't care if you fail. I don't care if you do well. I still love you the same. It's not based on your achievement. It's based on who you are inside. So helping them to find out who they are inside and love that person is going to be super helpful for Enneagram 3s as kids and youth. And also teaching them healthy competition, teaching them how to help others and how to engage competition in a way that isn't detrimental to them or ruins the fun that comes from competing in all. And so cooperation with them is really pivotal. The word cooperation, being able to cooperate with different groups of people, being a part of them. How do I engage with a group of people and not just be the solo person who stands out or the lone wolf or having patience with other people within a group is going to be very important for Enneagram 3s as kids and youth. Enneagram 4s. All right. So one of the things I think is very important for Enneagram 4s is breathing techniques when their emotional world becomes overwhelming, allowing them space and time to get those emotions out, then thinking through the reality of them. So 4s, as we know, have this deep, deep, deep emotional world within them, which is beautiful, but it can be very confusing for parents who do not understand or who may not be in the feeling triad. I would say maybe if you're not a two or nine, it may be or four. It could be confusing if you have a child who is a four because their emotions are big and they're deep and they're and they're just like vast. And so with them, the one thing you don't want to do and which becomes hard for a lot of types is to tell a four to shut their emotions off or stop it or anything like that, because a part of them growing is being able to experience and express them. And so one thing you want to be able to do is to give them the space to express them. And they express emotions typically longer than anyone else. That's just how it is. And for some of them, it may take three or four days or a week. It sounds a little a little crazy for some of us types, but it's just sometimes what they need. Now, you do have to pay attention to make sure it's not going too negative, but you want to give them a medium even to maybe express it. And that's one reason they're so creative. So is there some type of creative medium or art or thing that they can do that helps express express some of those deep and vast emotions. And then two breathing techniques, even if you don't understand the deepest ones, helping them to breathe deeply into their stomach and their belly, and then breathing back out through their mouths and then understanding breathing then and helping them to become present to the moment. Because those emotions and all of those things are usually caught up in the past and past things that have happened. And so it's emoting from there. And so helping them to constantly combat some of that while understanding that you are still present at this moment physically right here, though your emotions may be stuck in the past and you feel them now. And so helping them different breathing techniques can really, really help for fours. And so it is helping them with that, helping them obviously with gratitude, realizing the good things that are going on because they can get trapped in some of the, the things that are melancholy, sad, bad, whatever, frustrating, that suck, uh, painful in life, they can get kind of trapped in those. So also helping them to understand what are some grateful things? What are some things you're thankful for? You know, Thanksgiving just passed. What are some of these things you're thankful for that you have that are so amazing? And so helping them to realize those can help them kind of gear themselves a little bit out of that portion of being stuck in some of those deep emotions that may sometimes go too negative. And so then when I talked about thinking as well, you want to introduce the thinking portion of them into their emotions as well once they had a time to express them, because that's going to have kind of help balance those emotions when they're able to think their way like, OK, I know I feel this way, but if I introduce some rationalization, I will realize that I won't be trapped here forever in this moment or that moment in the past 
does not equate to my whole future in life. So let me balance that out with my rationalization of thinking. Be very important. So self-confidence and optimism are huge for forwards. If you can work on teaching them self-confidence and optimism, finding different ways to do those two things, it's going to do leaps and bounds for them. And some forwards seem extremely happy, look like sevens as kids and children. But make sure you check on their inner world because they can be smiling when they're with everybody else, but they go to their rooms and they cry deeply. So you want to make sure you address the self-confidence and optimism of them and helping them to realize those things going on within their inner world. And they can express those through their inner world and creativity that they do have. Next, fives, invite them to fun and adventure. Asked to join part of their inner world by discovering what is interesting to them. So the one thing is that sometimes for fives, because of the personality of the five can be so thick, a lot of times it can make them want to be a recluse and kind of get away. Or if they're somewhere, just blend in so much that they're not seen because they're observing the room. They're picking up all these cues. But the issue is that they're not engaged a lot of times in what's going on. And sometimes what can happen is that they can almost feel like intrusion, like somebody inviting them to something is an intrusion upon their personal and inner space and time. And so something you do want to do and not too abrasively is you want to invite them to do fun and adventurous things, things that hopefully interest them. But sometimes you want to kind of get them out of their element a little bit and show them some really fun things that they can do with friends and family. Now, don't overdo it because their energy level is going to wane probably quicker than most unless they're extremely into what you're talking about. But inviting them, always giving an invitation, even if they don't take it, lets them know that you care and they value that. And so they may not come the first four times, but that fifth time, they'll be like, I'll give it a shot. I'll come this time. And so it's very important for them to see that you do care about them. You will love them to be there. And you understand that it may not be their cup of tea. They may not want to be there. But that builds connection with them, even though it may not seem like it at times because they're just like, no, I'm good. Natural response. No, I'm good. Mm, no, nah, I don't want to do that. Uh, no, thank you. So always having an invitation for a five to be able to be there is going to be crucial for kids and youth for sure. And then also when asking to join part of their inner world by discovering what they're interested in. So one of the things that you can do that usually works really well with kids or youth or fives is asking what's the latest thing you've read? What are you interested in? And figuring out those things and then getting yourself interested into their inner world. I'm going to let you know, when you get into their inner world, there is so much going on. And so when they start speaking about it, be prepared to be present and listen for quite a while. They can go on and on and on. It's really not an off switch when they really get to going. So you'll be like, hold on, I need to uh, take a break and uh, go get some water or food or something because they can go on and on about it. But that's also a beautiful way to build communication and relationship with them. Because the one thing that fives, if you're working with the five, they really need to help on is to how to build communication, how to not only express that I do not want to be there, or I do not want to do this, but to express the things that they really long for deep down, because those are the things they cover up really thickly with their personality mask, because they want connection, like all of us, but helping them to get to the point where they can communicate that in a healthy way and communicate some things that they're feeling because they can have such a non-attachment or a detachment for their emotions and their body sometimes that they don't communicate those things. And then they're very frustrated in their minds about them. But if you can help them communicate them, it'll help their whole situation and world flow better because now people understand them at a better level. So super huge for them. All right, next. Six is counterphobic or phobic. So is your kid or youth more counterphobic or more phobic? This depends. You want to find out, are they more fearful or are they more like, I got to go against the grain? And if they're counterphobic, they may look kind of like an eight a little bit. But what you'll notice, different between a six and an eight, a lot of times the counterphobia of the six is they're going against an authority figure. Someone they feel or authority they feel that's not right, that is wrong, and that's where they're bold. In other places, they won't, they'll follow the rules. It's not a problem. But their counterphobia usually goes towards an authority figure who they may feel is not doing what they're supposed to be doing or not doing something the right way. So one thing you do want to do when working with six is you want to talk about fear and be consistent and a reliable person that supports them while giving them the tools to make strong decisions alone. Because what they do want, they do love a good support system, someone they know that they can trust 
and someone they know that is loyal and someone they know who can support them in the decisions and different things that they make. So what you want to do is you want to directly address a lot of this fear because addressing this fear allows sixes in their minds to kind of like try to work their way out of their fear and kind of help them a little bit rationalize their way out of it so they're not caught in it so deeply and stop rethinking the good thoughts they already thought and thinking negatively of them. And then two, talking about that fear helps them to sometimes realize that maybe this is something I shouldn't necessarily be fearful about, even though I may struggle with it. Also, when it comes to helping them make strong decisions alone, that is so important for, to teach them how to trust themselves. Trust for themselves can be very difficult for sixes. The next thing is connect how they can overcome past fears when they seem to be frozen or overly agitated. Give them the best case scenario to balance some of the worst case scenario thinking. Sixes can come up with the worst thing that can happen in any situation. I don't know if it's like the best superpower, but it does help them to be prepared for situations when most people aren't. So helping them, helping give them the best case scenario or helping or giving them a question saying, OK, that's the worst thing that could happen. What's the best thing that could happen? It's going to help balance that thinking some and help them not to go too deep in the worst case scenario and get trapped and entrenched in fear. Sixes are the most brave kids out of all kids because they truly know what fear is. And so what you want to do is help them to see how in the past they've overcome certain fears and how that leads to them being able to overcome whatever fear that they have currently right now in their lives. So that's going to be a really good point of like kind of connecting the dots of saying, but you overcame that two years ago. You overcame that last month. You can overcome this. And so helping their minds to kind of train themselves out of completely negative and fear thinking is going to really help them to make successful moves in the future. So confidence and adaptability is going to be huge for teaching sixes and confidence because a lot of times they think the worst case scenario are negative. And so sometimes that has applied to even their self image. And so what you want them to do is have confidence in themselves to trust themselves and learn that I am a person that is trustworthy and I do have a great support system and loyal people, but I don't have to have them to make great and smart and safe choices. And then the next is adaptability, helping them to learn how to adapt to different situations. Most likely the six is already thought of every bad way things could happen. So that's great. So now you can think of every way of how to adapt and be okay in each situation, even though you realize that most likely 99% of the situations you thought of won't happen. But guess what? You're prepared just in case they all do. All right, next, sevens. Sevens is teaching self-control, focus, and dealing with uncomfortable emotions. I have a mentee who's a seven. It wears me out because I'm a seven. So I see many of the things that he does that I used to do, and it is annoying as I'll get out. Um, and so sevens can make your day a like the most beautiful, bright, fun, joyful day, or that can be the most annoying uh, kid in the world. Um, so what you want to do is really help them understand what self-control is for themselves and learning how to rein in their personality and the impulsivity that they have. And so teaching them self-control is going to be super huge for sevens. If you can teach them that, my goodness, the world is their, I don't know, pearl, oyster, I don't know what they say. But then also focus, helping them to do things that focus. One thing my mom did as a child, she put me in chess. So putting them in something that makes them have to slow down and think is going to be super good. And it's going to be super uncomfortable for them at first until they get used to whatever that activity is. Even if it's art or something, chess, or even if it's a sport that makes them have to slow down and be more strategic and think, that is going to be like leaps and bounds great for our Enneagram 7. And then the other thing, too, is dealing with uncomfortable emotions. A lot of times, sevens are the ones when someone's getting on to them because they did something wrong or in a the group, they're the ones smiling. And not because they're trying to be disrespectful, but it's because uncomfortable emotions make them smile because that's the only way they know how to deal with them. And that gets them in trouble a lot of times. Trust me, I know it's happened to me when I was growing up. So helping them to deal with uncomfortable and painful emotions is going to be huge because when you start to address those with the seven, they're going to get really squirmy. They're going to try to change the topic. They're going to do a lot of different things and not want to deal with it. But helping them to stay there just for a little moment at times is going to be very beneficial for helping them to grow because if they don't deal with it, uncomfortable emotions, a seven will never grow and they will stay in Peter Pan, have fun land and not live in reality and really address the problems and issues they have going on. So it's, it's going to be impossible for them to truly grow and become the best version of themselves for other people. So 
Self-control, super huge. Coming up with different ways to help them with self-control is going to be great for the seven. Eight, helping them see their impact on the world around them, how their actions can get in the way of what they really want. Give them more responsibility than you would give most kids their age and call out aggressive behavior. So eights do not sometimes realize just the impact they have on the world, especially as kids, impact on other people, impact on situations. They have such a strong presence. It doesn't matter if this if the eight is a little girl who weighs like 60 pounds, she has major impact on wherever she goes. And so sometimes eights don't realize truly the impact they have. Sometimes they understand kind of they wield a little bit of power and they can be mean and bully sometimes. They can be overly protective as well. But realizing the power that they have and the impact they have on other people is going to be grand because that's going to introduce a little bit of empathy for them, for other people and themselves, helping them to understand that a lot of people don't feel like you feel on the inside. And some of the things you feel on the inside, you need to express the subtleties and the softness of life you need to express because you're covering them up by all this rough and tough exterior. But that inside is soft and gushy and nice and sweet and all those wonderful things. But you have to allow people to be able to see some of it and protect yourself so you're not being hurt as well. And so helping them to understand that in their want to not be hurt, a lot of times they can hurt a lot of other people and helping them to see that. So when I talk about calling aggression out, you have to call their aggression out because sometimes they don't know that it's aggressive. They're just like, I'm just being myself. And that's just really being their personality, not necessarily themselves. But they don't understand their threshold for aggression, assertiveness and pain is totally different than others. So helping them to understand like, oh, that was a little bit aggressive. That was over the top. I think I offended some people and I wasn't trying. Helping them to realize that is going to be super helpful for Enneagram 8 kids and youth. And then I say uh, one of the important things I heard uh, Susan Stabile say this is give 8s more responsibility. They're usually more mature than a lot of different kids for a lot of different reasons. So if you give them more responsibility in doing things, they usually can accomplish them without a problem because 8s like to get things done. And they like to have things done right, to be honest, for the most part, until their personality is triggered, then there's a whole different situation. But they like things to be done and they like for them to be done the right way because they are about justice. And so if you can give your eight youth or kid more responsibility, great. And then when they mess up and they don't do things right or they're over aggressive with something, take the responsibility away from them for a while as a consequence. And then add it back when they get on the back on the right track. That can be super helpful for youth and kids who are eights. And so making sure teaching them empathy is going to be super huge. Understanding other people do not feel exactly like them and that that's OK. And so how you express yourself and address things can always be exactly like you feel on the inside. Sometimes it's going to be super important for eights. Nines, make them feel special and include it for them allowing them to be unique while helping them address underlying anger and frustrations they have in life. Call out passive aggressive behavior. So one of the things about nines, they a lot of times they do not feel like special. A lot of kids have moments and where parents or individuals make them feel like they're special, make them feel like they are, you know, just uh, the diamond in the eye, just like a diamond in the rough or anything, just some something special at times. You know, it doesn't last forever, hopefully, but there's something special. A lot of times nines don't necessarily feel special. They feel kind of left out, like they feel kind of forgotten. So one thing you want them to realize is like, no, you're special, you're unique and you're, you're amazing. So including them on things is going to be super huge. They'll usually come along with you, but making sure that they understand that you're not just a part of the group. You're important because you are in this group. So your voice and everything, your thoughts and feelings, they all matter. So that's super important. And then also being careful with nines because nines, it's easy to pick on nines, especially as kids and children, as in like to talk about them, to make fun of them. They're like the end, the butt of the joke and things like that. Be careful and be aware of that because that's slowly chipping away at their actual self-esteem. It's just they're just taking it as a nine. They just like, yeah, I can just disassociate with it. But it's still chipping away at their confidence and their self-esteem. So be aware of that, like when you do it as an adult, but also as kids do it as well, addressing that because it'll seem like they're okay with just taking it. But it is basically chipping away at their self-confidence. So you have to be aware of that. 
and make sure that is stopped. And then also allowing them, like I said, to be unique while also helping them address anger. Because a lot of times nines are like, no, I'm not angry. I don't really get angry. So helping them to realize and figure out what are you angry about? Everyone experiences anger, but why are you angry? And so you may have to use a different word because anger can be a bad word for nines. You may say, what frustrates you? What gets on your nerves? Different phrases and ways of getting to nines to help them understand like, oh, you may be angry about this. So let's address this real quick. And then helping them also, similar to the two, address boundaries and how to talk to people and say, no, you won't treat me that way because I am valuable and I love who I am, so you won't talk to me like that. And so helping them address that is gonna be super important for nines as well. And so also I would say one word is, um, oh, but call out their passive aggressive behavior too. Because they usually don't address the anger that they have, they have a, a tendency to be passive aggressive. And so you have to call that behavior out because it will be very passive aggressive. You'd be like, why are you doing all that? What's really going on? So you have to help them address that and so that they don't continue to do passive aggressive behaviors and destroy the harmony and peace that they really want by their own behavior. And the one word I would say for them is teaching them initiative. Because it's so easy for nines to say, I'd like to do this one day. I want to do that. I want to do this. Like a lot of children. But the issue with the nine a lot of times is that unless they're like the social nine doing it for the group, a lot of times what they really want inside, they'll say, oh, I'd love to do that. But they literally don't even put a plan together to do it. Where other types may write it down on paper, but never really get to it. Sometimes nines don't even like, they'll just mention it, but they will not put like a plan in place. They will not start getting the resources they need to build it. So help build their dreams with them and help them to take the initiative to do those things. Give them the space and freedom to create and to be themselves and to get out and search for and achieve and go for the things that they need so that they can actually, you know, have a healthy and happy life and not just go along with the flow and be numb to life, but actually live in life and be awake in life. So like I said before, some of the resources that I'm going to attach to this is the emotion wheel. The emotion wheel is so important. You start from the inside and you work your way out. So there's like the big six emotions on the inside. You choose one of those, you're feeling, and you start to work your way out. And you can show kids this. I think it's super important. I gave all my teachers this and I work with this with the kids I work with in my school because it helps you to identify what in the world is going on inside of me. Because some of us can name the emotions like the back of our hands. Unlike me and a lot of other types, I struggle to name the emotion. And so when I can figure out what emotion it is and get to the very more specific one that I'm dealing with, then I can start to question myself, why are you having anxiety at this point? What are you scared of? What are you not prepared for? So then I can actually address it instead of just sit with it and start acting out of my personality, smiling, being silly, being funny. It's like, what are you, what are you not dealing with right now? So that's super important for each and everybody in the emotion world. The next book, I say, Finding the Birthday Cake, Helping Children Raise Their Self-Esteem. And so that's a really good book. It has pictures in it and everything. You can read it to your child. You can have your child read it, depending on how old they are. Then the next book, The Enneagram for Teens. This book is a little bit bigger, but not that much bigger. And it has some pictures in it, too. But it's The Enneagram for Teens. Discover your personality, type, and celebrate your true self. Super huge in the teenage years. If you can help a kid develop in their teenage years, the magic that will happen in their lives and the better the choices they can make down the line. Next, the Enneagram of Parenting, the Nine Types of Children and How to Raise Them Successfully by Elizabeth Waggle. I hope I said her last name right. But that book right there is going to look at some of the things you can do as a parent when working with different numbers as kids and some of the things you can do to hopefully help them to combat some of the negative or lower sides of their personality, which would be very beneficial. Uh, and the last one is N1 Games, and that's N1 Games. That's n-1games.com forward slash index dot html. So I really want to release this episode. And I think this episode is a little bit longer than I expect it to be. Yep, it's going on an hour. But I think it's so important to get the knowledge of inner work from the Enneagram to youth and kids because I think about how many bad decisions I've made because of my personality patterns and my type because I was on the lower side because I did not know. And at the time, the decision I made inside, it felt like the right thing to do. Or maybe it didn't feel like the right thing to do, but I didn't know what to do because the way I was feeling, thinking, and sensing on the inside. And so the sooner you can get this information piece by piece to your youth or kids, I feel like the better. 
And I feel like kids are resilient. I think there was a fear in one of the rooms. A lady was like, well, what happens if they do this and learn this and they try to live this? Kids are already trying to live a certain way anyway, based on their peers a lot of times. But the more we can get the actual inner work that they need to do to help them be healthy and make smart decisions and love themselves, the better they're going to be, in my opinion, because kids are resilient. I work with kids who have been through some of the craziest stuff and to see them keep pushing and working and trying. It touches my heart deeply because I know if they can understand these things, they can start to love themselves and make better decisions going forward in their lives. That means not only can they love themselves, but they can help make better choices in their communities. That means you're healing communities. You're healing people. That means you're changing the world a person at a time, even if it's a little person. And a lot of times, you know, as kids, you don't always see the impact you have on them. But those conversations you have, even though it seems that they're not listening They are. They're picking it up. And sometimes they have to hear it three, four, five, six, seven times before it catches and latches on. But they won't forget those things. Sometimes we're just the person planting the seed and someone else comes and waters it. And so we have to understand that we play a different part in it. And you may be the person watering to see it grow. But keep doing the work because I know if you're listening to this episode and you work with kids, then you love those kids most likely, or you're struggling trying to help a kid, someone, a kid or youth that you love. Keep up the hard work because it does pay off because they are latching on, they are catching it and know it's not perfect and they won't make always great decisions. And life is weird in some ways and every situation doesn't turn out great, but you keep doing the work because there's still an impact for them, their lives, their families, and you. So I thank you so much for listening to this. If you're looking for coaching and consulting, you can go to kaizencareers.com, my website where I do coaching and consulting, which obviously I love to do, working with organizations and individuals. Also, don't forget to do it for the grand podcast.com where you can get the mugs and there's also t-shirts there. 2020 is a big year. I know the episodes at the end of this year have been I'm a little spacey, but I've been really trying to prepare for 2020, the episodes there, but also events. I have an event. I have an event coming up in June. It's going to be called right now Wellness and Work, and I want you to be there. It's going to be coming online very soon, how you can sign up and pay for it and everything and get there. Uh, It's going to be in Memphis, but I would really love to have you all there going to be a really good time teaching different parts of the Enneagram to you and doing different activities to help stretch you, grow you, and help make you better for your community uh, and your family. So thank you so much for listening. If you're struggling trying to figure out what should I do, should I teach this kid the Enneagram? Should I start piecemealing it? I'm a fear. Yes, kids are resilient. Do it. Do it for the gram, the Enneagram, of course, and do it for them and their lives. And I'll see you next time. Bye.